It's a real joy for me to be here. I've been looking forward to coming here for about 12 years. Is that how long you guys have been going? I tell you what though, I did, we did solve a conundrum for me yesterday because we've been going through pandemics and lockdowns in England just like you guys have over here. And there was a couple of strange things that happened. And one is that some of the things that you couldn't get in the stores and we couldn't get toilet paper anywhere. Did you guys have that problem? We, for some strange reason, there was no shortage apparently, but you just couldn't get it. There, were, there was like this mad rush on toilet paper. And the other thing that we had, there was a massive shortage of, was televisions. Couldn't find a television anywhere. I've solved the mystery. <laughs> Honestly, you walk around this building like Pastor James and his TV thing. I don't know, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> So when I go home next week, I'm going to tell everybody, we're just going to blame Pastor James. So honestly, it's, it's, it's wonderful, but thank the Lord for televisions. But it is, a, I've never been to Mississippi before. I mean, I've driven through a few times, but I've never been before. It is beautiful. And that whole Southern hospitality thing, it's real. It really is. I mean, you just have made me feel so incredibly welcome. If you are suffering from low self-esteem, See if you can be a guest speaker at Agape just for one day, because you'll leave feeling like a king or a queen. Miss Nisi, it's so nice to see you. It's been a very, very long time, so it's wonderful to see you. And um, I'm just really glad to be here. There's a fire shut up in my bones. I want to take just a minute and share a little bit about me. I won't take long on this, but if I don't take a little bit of time to explain who I am and where I come from, then you might wonder, you know, oh, let me put it this way. I am nuts, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. So don't worry about me. But so my story begins when I was six years old. My parents uh, were born again when I was in my mother's womb. There was a guy that knocked on the door of my home, my parents' home, and he asked this question. He said, what's the next letter in the alphabet after S? And my dad said, T. And he said, oh, I'd love one, thank you, and walked in the house, came in for a cup of tea. And you know, dutifully, my, my mother made him a cup of tea. He sat down, told, us, told my parents all about the Lord. And they were born again right there and then in the living room. And I thank God for that. So the first six years of my life, we went to a, a little church just south of London that preached the gospel, well, sin, the cross, and forgiveness. And every week they'd preach the gospel. And again, thank the Lord for that. But then when I was about six years old, there was an evangelist that came to England from Australia. And um, there was miracles and signs and wonders going on in his meetings. And we didn't have that in our church. We used to joke, we thought we were very funny. I doubt the pastor thought we were funny, but the joke we used to say is the only signs in our church were the exit signs above the door. The only miracles if you could stay awake throughout the whole sermon. And the only thing you had to wonder about was if anyone would come back the next week. And so when we heard there was miracles, I mean, we wanted to see it. So we got on the train, we went up to London and the building is called the Central Halls in, in uh, Westminster. It's a stone's throw from the, um, from the Houses of Parliament. Don't throw stones, you'll be arrested. But if you were to, it's a stone's throw. And so I'll never forget this first night. There was a lady there and she had a deformed hand. And it wasn't arthritic, she wasn't elderly, and it was, you know, it was half the size of her other hand. And when the evangelist prayed for her, her hand grew out right in front of my eyes. And my eyes got as big as saucers. There was many other miracles happened that night. That's the only one I so distinctly remember. But the next night we went back and I was standing on the chair when he was praying for the sick. There was about a thousand people there. To me, it was like a Colosseum. There was, you know, only just a, a handful of people in our church counting pregnant women twice. And so I was standing on the chair watching and I did something we didn't do in our church. I closed my eyes, I raised my hands to heaven. And when I did that, God dropped a vision in my heart as clear as I could see the person standing in front of me. And I saw two things. I saw myself preaching the gospel and demonstrating the power of God. I knew, I knew the purpose for my life. I knew what God had for me. That was my little sliver of the pie. But I saw something so much bigger than me. And I saw a revival. I didn't know what revival was. I didn't know revival is two French words stuck together. Re, which means again, and vivre, which means life. I didn't know that, but I saw it. And it was like I had a satellite view of Europe and, and I thought it was nighttime because it was dark. But I believe what I was seeing was Isaiah chapter 60, which says that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. It says, but the Lord will arise on you and His light will be seen on you. And it said, Gentiles will come to that light. And I had this view of Europe from a satellite image and it was like I was, I was zooming in. This was in this vision. 
and I could see lights breaking out and, or, or shining up all across Europe, coming out of arenas and stadiums and, and churches and buildings. And as I got closer, it's like I came into one of those arenas where that light was coming from. And I felt the atmosphere. It was crackling with the miraculous. I could see people from every direction running to that place. The, 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 um, the passion in there, the worship, the hunger, the, the miraculous, people running to Jesus. You weren't twisting your arm behind people's back to get them to pray the sinner's prayer. Jesus kind of standing there, cap in hand, you know, will you receive Him? No, they were crying out, how can I be saved? And I understand, you know, if you take a man that's never been wet and you try to explain wet to him, you can't do it. You can talk about, you know, the water tingles, it's, it's refreshing, it's, but, but you can't explain wet to someone that's never been wet. But if you take that same man and you hold him underwater in a swimming pool for about five seconds, pull him back out, you don't have to say a word. He knows exactly what wet feels like. And it was like God took me and He helped me under the spirit of revival for about five seconds. And I know what He means when He says, I will write my word on your heart because He tattooed the word revival on my heart when I was six years old. And I have wanted nothing else my entire life. My, my dad lives in heaven now. My mother lives just, just around the corner from us. She'll be able to tell you. I've wanted nothing else my entire life other than to see with my physical eyes what I saw with the eyes of my spirit when I was six years old. That's my why. Everything I do. I can tell you what I do. I lead a church under Christ in England, in Birmingham, not Birmingham, Birmingham, England. And we've been there, my wife and I have been there 16 years. I travel around the world as well. We have a television program on TBN and a radio program on UCB, United Christian Broadcasters. I do, I do lots, that's what I do, but why I do it, I, I lead worship, but why I lead worship, I, that, I lead from that place. That's why I'm here today. I, I was looking forward to seeing Pastor James and Nisi. I'm excited to see Mississippi. I wanted to see all your televisions. I'm blown away by the building and... What's gone on this town is, is wonderful, but you can see all that kind of stuff on Pinterest. I can, I can be a voyeur through Facebook. I haven't come here to entertain you. I haven't come here for any other reason other than to stand and let the, the fire that's in me connect with the fire that's in you. And the iron that God has placed in me to, to, to lock with the iron that He's placed in you and to do something together that we can't do alone. That's the fire that burns in me. That's the passion that burns in me. So you may be impressed, you may be unimpressed. Some of my jokes you'll get, some you won't. In fact, one of the things I always enjoy is if I can tell a joke and it goes right over everybody's head, that's kind of the English way. You sort of slide in humor. So an American will stand there and tell you a joke. The other day, three people walked into a bar. In England, you just kind of slide in a little. So my sister... She used to work for us, our ministry over here, and she's seven years older than me. And she is great with punctuation, just is. So apostrophes, all that kind of stuff. So I used to introduce her as my sister, our business manager. I say she has a, a tremendous apostrophic anointing. And people go, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> they didn't take the time to think, what's an apostrophic anointing? I didn't say apostolic. I said, she's just good with apostrophes. That's her, that's her anointing. You know, it's like we say, come up here and play something metacrational. You know, I'm going to start flowing in the pathetic. No. <laughs> so I like to kind of slide this. So you'll get some of my jokes. You won't get others of them, but that's totally fine. I haven't come here to entertain you or to be entertained by you. I've come to burn with you. So I'm going to go to the keyboard. We're going to take a few minutes more to worship. I don't know if you know the songs. I don't know if you will. I don't know if you won't. I'm going to ask, just keep the lights exactly as they are. But I am going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to take a minute to worship together. Oh, it's like multiplied microphones. Should I switch this one out? Let me trade it. Because I practiced with this one. Let me see if I can hear this. were the word at the beginning one with god the lord most high do you know this song the hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our christ what a beautiful name what a beautiful name it is 
what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down Our sin was great your love was greater what could separate us see what a wonderful name what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Sing that second verse again. You didn't want heaven without us. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you come on, let me hear you sing. My sin was great. My sin, but your love was greater. What could separate? Could separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. Come on. The name of Jesus Christ, my what a wonderful name it is nothing compares nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus Come on, take a moment and tell him his name's wonderful. Jesus, you're wonderful. Jesus, you're wonderful. You're so amazing. Jesus, you're wonderful. Jesus, you're wonderful. Do you know this bit? Sing that death couldn't hold you apart. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and the heavens are roaring, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised, for you are raised to life. Now sing this out, you have no rival, you have no I surrender all. I surrender all to you. 
everything I give. Come on, you don't get wet looking at a river. You only get wet when you jump in. I surrender all to you. Everything, everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Oh, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Sing, I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. I surrender. I surrender. On everything I give. Everything I give. I give myself away. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. Come on, sing that one more time. The bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring in praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. For you are raised to life again. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of what a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we love you. Lord, I'm asking you to come and do something wonderful in this place. Do something wonderful in our hearts, Lord, mine included. I don't just want to watch what you do. Lord, I want to be part of it. surrender all, all to you, my Jesus, you're worth it all, you're my Jesus, you're worth it all, you're my hero, you're my very best friend, and you're my king, the king of kings. So Lord, walk in this room. Walk in this room. Lord, we read about what you've done all over the world. But I'm asking you, would you do it in this place? 
Would you do it in this place? Lord, we bless you. We honor you. We magnify you. Be glorified. And Lord, I'm asking you today, use my tongue like a pen and write your word on our hearts. Lord, I pray that I would say what you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Lord, I ask you, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us today, what your spirit is saying to this church. And Lord, I pray that we would jump in with everything we have. Lord, that there would be very little of us and a whole lot of you. Jesus, be glorified. In your mighty name, I pray. Go ahead and take your seat if you would for a few moments, but please stay standing on the inside. I want to ask you to turn over to Psalm chapter 46. Open your Bibles or turn it on, whatever is your way. Psalm chapter 46. The nice thing about having several days together is we don't have to say it all in one service. And I find this many times the way God uses me is it's like we, we jump in the river on a Sunday morning and God comes and takes us by the hand. In fact, we'll be talking about that a little bit today and He leads us deeper. And then you get out on a Wednesday night and you think, man, I am not where I was. And it's been beautiful and it's been powerful, but it's like He just takes us on a journey. And I believe that God is calling us to grow. There's nothing in nature that stays the same. Everything changes. And in fact, the, the, the generation of new life is found in change and in death, believe it or not. Certain things we have to die to and leave alone and leave behind. But God has a beautiful way of doing that where we feel like death is swallowed up in victory and, and, and death is overwhelmed with life. And, and, and the newness of what God is bringing us into makes leaving behind old things so simple and so wonderful that you don't even recognize you're gonna miss them. I wanna talk today about the river of God. In fact, this week I wanna, I wanna preach under this title, There is a River. Everyone say, There is a River. There is a river. The Bible says this in Psalm chapter 46, verse one. It says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of our God. Say it again, there is a river. There's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice, the earth melted. But the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Bible says there is a river that makes glad the city of God. In other words, when that river starts to flow, heaven gets happy. Everyone say it again, there is a river. There is nowhere, there's no city, there's no state, there's no nation that doesn't change when the river of God starts to flow. I've been to Tokyo, I've been to Lagos, Nigeria, I've been to London, I've been to Washington, D.C., I've been to Brisbane, I've been to 32 countries around the world. I can tell you right now, there's not a city that I've been to that can't be changed and impacted when the river of God starts to flow. We need the river. We absolutely desperately need the river. Cities aren't changed because we come to church. Cities are changed because the river starts to flow. Cities aren't changed because our church is bigger or smaller, darker or lighter, more TVs or less TVs, perspex pulpits or old fashioned wooden pulpits. Those things are nice, but that's all us. It helps us, but the river is what makes a difference. The Bible says the river makes heaven happy. So what happens when there is no river? A frowny face emoji. <laughs> a frowny face emoji. I don't know if God uses emojis, but if He did, it'd be a frowny face. But man, when the river starts to flow, the Bible says heaven gets glad. Heaven gets happy. It changes everything. So I want to talk for a few minutes today, kind of a, a little bit of a precursor about, 
I, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. There's many analogies used in the Bible to describe the Holy Spirit. He's described as fire, oil, wind. There's many different analogies. He's likened to a dove. But the one I want to talk about today is water. There's something very special about God and water. In fact, whenever you see water mentioned in the Bible, you know it will have something to do with the moving of the Holy Spirit. And there's three specific water words that are used. The first one is this, is the well. In fact, the well of the Holy Spirit, there's the well, there's the river, and there's the rain. The well or the well working of the Holy Spirit is the, is the working of the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus said to the woman at the well, He said, the water that I give you will be in you, a well of life springing up into everlasting life. When you are first born again and you are born of the Spirit, you hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus, with your mouth you confess Him as Savior, you are born and you're born again. You are born of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and He lives inside of you and His ministry inside of you is like a well. It's very personal. It, it, it's for you. It's in you. This is when you first begin. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your, child, with your spirit that you're a child of God. That happens when you're born again. The, the witness of the Holy Spirit. How do I know I'm born again? I know because I just know. I know that I know that I know. Well, how do you know? In reality or theologically, it's because the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. That's how you know. But there's many other things that go on at this stage. The Bible describes the Holy Spirit as a comforter. That is the well working of the Holy Spirit. He makes intercession for you according to the will of God. The Bible says you don't need any man to teach you, but the anointing that you've received of Him will teach you all things. That is the well working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of wisdom. You know what to do. The Spirit of revelation. You begin to see things. As you read the Bible, He starts to teach you. That all happens the moment you're born again. And if those things aren't going on in your life, it lets you know your well is a little bit dry. But the good news is this, the well is the Holy Spirit and He never disappears. The moment you say, fill me, He's right there. But that is the, that's the personal work of the Holy Spirit. And you go to that well anytime you need water, anytime you need revelation, anytime you need a guide. He's a light for your feet, a lamp for your path. He, he, he leads you, He directs you. The Holy Spirit working in you. And I don't know how people function without that relationship with the Holy Spirit. I really, really don't. I don't know how people function without the relationship. I mean, just a silly little thing. So the other day I was speaking on Wednesday and Thursday at a conference in England for the United Christian Broadcast. It was a European leaders conference. And I was the Wednesday morning, Wednesday night and Thursday morning speaker. I double booked by mistake. And so I had a flight that left at one o'clock on um, Wednesday, Thursday to come here. So I was kind of rushing around. But as I was getting ready to go from my house on the Wednesday morning to the first session, it's about a one hour drive. I got up early because I was packing some things. I wasn't going home again before coming here. I was trying to squeeze everything into a little carry-on bag so that I didn't have to, you know, deal with waiting for my suitcase and whatnot. So anyways, I was going to leave at 7.45. That would give me plenty of time to get there. It's an hour drive, starts at nine o'clock. As I woke up, I felt the Holy Spirit say, leave at 6.30. Well, I didn't want to leave at 6.30 because that meant rushing around even faster. And I mean, it only takes about five minutes for all this magic to happen, but still I had to pack my bag and this, that and the other. So Anyways, I really felt this, leave at 6.30. Well, I get out there, I get on the motorway, I'm driving down the road, I'm boom, the traffic stops. And I went absolutely nowhere for about an hour and a quarter. And I arrived right when I wanted to arrive, but I'd left an hour and 20 minutes earlier. Had I left when I was gonna leave, I'd have been late, I'd have missed the whole thing. That'd be embarrassing. I'm English, being late is just, you just don't do it over there. And so, how, it's a little thing. It didn't change the world, but it's a little thing. I don't know how we function without the Holy Spirit, the inward witness, leading you, guiding you, directing you. But the Bible says, he that has an ear, let him hear. We're the opposite. We think it's he that has a mouth, let him speak. We never shut up. And we have so much stimuli. Don't, please do not raise your hands. But some of you sit on the toilet and have your phone on YouTube. Don't raise your hands. It probably, it probably happens in other churches. I'm sure no one in this church would do that. You ever bumped into your teenager and they're on their phone and the only reason you bumped into them is because you were on your phone. 
It's just nonstop, constant podcast and input. And, and when do we ever get quiet? I say to my own son, Levi, I said, buddy, you gotta be able to think your own thoughts, A and B, hear the voice of God. You can't do that if you got constant input. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. If you will get quiet, you will find that the Holy Spirit is speaking a lot. But I used to say, and I thought I was quite cute. I used to say things like this. I'd say, God would have to write on the wall before I'd move to, and I'd name a place like China. In fact, I'd say, God would have to write on all four walls before I'd go somewhere like that or do this or whatever the thing I was talking about. And I was preaching one day and I felt the Holy Spirit say, John, why do I have to write on four walls before you do what I ask you to do? Well, you can preach and repent at the same time. So I was up there, I was saying, Lord, I'm sorry. And in fact, when I got back to my hotel room afterwards, I knelt down, I said, Lord, you, oh, just whisper, just whisper. You know, it was incredible. I found that God started whispering a lot. He had a lot to say. I was in this service the other day and I didn't know, but the director of United Christian Broadcasters, friends, his name's Claude. He had tendonitis in his arm so bad he couldn't touch his fingers. He couldn't put his hand in his pocket. He couldn't use, his arm had effectively become useless. Had no strength, couldn't hold a phone, couldn't move it. The pain was so intense. I didn't know that, but I'm standing there getting ready to come up. And I saw myself standing at the piano holding his hand. And I saw us kind of linking arms. Well, it was just a little simple thing, but I knew that was what God was wanted me to do. So we get up there and, and I'm, I'm talking away. I'm over at the keyboard. I say, hey, Claude, come grab my hand. And not just like a handshake, but you know that thing like when you're a real brother, so you grab each other's arm kind of part way up. And, 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 and so he went for the handshake. He said, no, grab here. And God healed his tendonitis. The whole lot's gone. He could use his phone, move his hand, put it in his pocket. I mean, he, was, he and his wife were in tears because this has become in completely debilitating for him. How do you know that? How did I know that? I didn't, but the Holy Spirit did. Man, being a Christian without the Holy Spirit is like being a boat without water. Or a fire without fire. I mean, it's just, you know what I mean? It's just not the same. And so the Holy Spirit begins in your life like a well. But there's another dynamic of the Holy Spirit the Bible teaches of, and that's the river. The well is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. It begins at the new birth. Whether you know it or not, it begins at the new birth. The river is the anoint, what we would more traditionally call the anointing. It's where God begins to flow through you. He starts touching people through you. He starts using you to minister to other people. It's what, again, it's the anointing. It's, it's, that, it's that outworking, that flowing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, on that last great day of the feast in John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus stood and cried, said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This is the Holy Spirit. And this he spoke of the Spirit, which hadn't yet been given because Jesus hadn't yet been glorified him quoting John 7, 37 through 39. Jesus spoke of a river that would flow out of us. I believe it's the river that we read about a moment ago that makes glad the city of our God. In fact, when that river starts to flow, heaven gets happy. I believe with all my heart, I'm not saying to hype or to build anything up. I believe that heaven will be very happy about what goes on in this room today and over the next few days. Because I'm telling you, I haven't come just because I don't have anything else to do. And you haven't come just to hear a British preacher. We have come because of the move of God. Do you know what I'm saying? We have come for that river. And I love what's gone on outside this building. But I believe with all my heart that that is just a physical manifestation of a change that's coming in the Spirit. Many, many times God will, the, the natural will, will parallel the spiritual. You, you find that even, you know, many times where there's rich natural resources in the area, like oil, you'll find that that place frequently experiences a move of God. And I believe when God, when something happens in the natural, something will also happen in the spiritual. God said to Abraham, He said, your descendants will be measured by the sand on the ground and by the stars in the sky. There's always a natural measuring and a spiritual measuring. And I tell you what, I've seen, because I've seen the pictures, I haven't been here, but I've seen the pictures. What's gone on outside this church, between you and me, possibly sparked by what's gone on in this church, which is pretty awesome. But I'm telling you, what's going on on the outside reflects the something that's coming that will have an equally significant transformation. Equally significant. This had a natural revolution, it's going to have a spiritual revolution. And people are coming right now to see the buildings, but people will come to see the river. They will come for the river.
They will come to get healed. They will come because they've heard that there's a God in that place and you can meet Him if you go there. I think I believe this more than you right now, but trust me, by Wednesday, you'll be more excited than me. What are people from Mississippi called? Is it Mississippians? Mississipponians? What are you? What, like, seriously? Mississippians. Okay. Because if you're from London, you're a Londoner. That's easy. I didn't... So the river, the outpouring and the outflowing of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said we will receive is when God begins to minister to others through you in a far greater measure. When you pray for someone and they get healed and you're as surprised as they are, that's when the river is starting to flow. When you talk to someone about the Lord and they're interested and you think, hang on a minute, God's doing something here. And God begins to use you and use your family and use your business and use your place of employment. And, and, and I believe that God wants everyone to flow in that because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse seven, he says, everyone that's called by my name, I've created for my glory. God has created you. Your life is to play a part in the glory of God being seen and experienced. God, the Bible says every joint supplies. We're like a body that that needs the toe and needs the finger and every joint supplies. Everyone has a role to play. And and you standing on the bank, kind of tapping your foot saying, nah, not my thing. That's not really an option. I mean, it is. God will still love you and you still go to heaven. But if you do that, there's something missing. When the river flows, the only real appropriate response is to jump in it because you don't get wet looking at a river. You only get wet when you jump in. And the Bible describes this river in Ezekiel chapter 47. Have a look there with me, if you would please. This morning is just kind of a warm-up. I'm going to pray for people in a minute, so, but it's just a warm-up. Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 1. Is everyone doing okay still? Can you understand what I'm saying? I'm not too English for you. Smile at me real big. Let me see your pearly whites. Say, we love you, John. Okay, just checking. Love you too. Ezekiel chapter 47. And verse one says this, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east because the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of this temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around to the outside, to the outer gate facing east and the water was flowing from the south side. You geographically confused too. I have no clue where he is right now. Started east, went to the south side. Anyways, As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, which is a third of a mile. Then he led me through the water, water that was ankle deep. He measured off another third of a mile and he led me through the water, water was knee deep. He measured off another thousand or third of a mile, led me through the water, the water was to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Araba where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be a large number of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. So the Bible talks about this river and it gives us several things that it helps us to know. Number one, it says the river begins in the throne of God. It's not man-generated. It can't be organized. You can't plan it. You can't advertise for it. You can't generate it through social media. This is a move of God, and it starts in the throne room of God. Every move of God begins in the throne room of God. Nothing goes on into the open place unless there's first been an encounter in the secret place. There is no outpouring without an infilling. You cannot give what you haven't first received. It begins in the throne room of God. And if you're disinterested in the throne room of God, you will only hear stories about the river. You won't experience the river for yourself. But Jesus' blood has given every single born again Christian access to a throne called grace. And you can come anytime you want, spend time in the presence of God. And the minute you do that, the river begins its flowing. The minute you do that. This is why I always take time to worship. Because it begins in the throne of God. 
And there is a, there is a starting point of a move of God. That absolutely flat out is a starting point. And if we can understand that starting point and, and come into the presence of God and access the throne of God, we can start the ball rolling, so to speak, of the river of God flowing. We'll get more into this as the days go on. I'm, I'm just throwing out some headlines. We'll dig into it over the next three or four days. But the Bible says that the river begins at the throne of God. And the first place the Bible says the river goes is to the desert. Desert in the Bible speaks of spiritual dryness speaks of a place that should be alive and should be flourishing, but now is dry. This is why Israel many times in their history was described as a, as a wilderness or a desert or a barren land. It's not just because geographically that part of the world is a desert. It's because it should be alive. It should be flourishing because it has a relationship with God and a covenant with God, but it isn't. It's dead. And so it's described as a wilderness or a dry place. But the Bible says the glory of God will be given there. That the glory of Lebanon, the excellency of Sharon, that streams will break out in the wilderness, fountains in the desert. God can make an oasis in a dry place. But today the desert speaks of the church. Should be alive, should be flourishing, should be full of the anointing of God, but is dry. Doesn't have the power of God. Doesn't experience the anointing regularly. And the, but the Bible says the first place the river goes is to the church. The desert. I'm so glad because it's almost kind of this, this, this wave of sentiment that while God doesn't need the church and I'm kind of tired of church and I'm not church, I'm kingdom. And, and well, you know, I don't, need, I don't need to go to church or God's just going to move, you know, God's turned His back on the church, He's going to move in the world. No, sir. It doesn't work that way. God flows through the church. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink and then out of your bellies will flow the rivers of living water. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high and then go into all the world. Why? Because otherwise you don't have anything to give. When the anointing came, it came where the Christians were. It came in the upper room and they took it out into Jerusalem. So don't give me any of this God's finished with the church. No, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it is dry right now. It is dry. And can I be honest with you? We can't blame lockdown and pandemics. The problem is we're not spending time in the throne room because that's the source point of the river. That's where it starts. And so this river, the Bible says, will go through the church and then it says it goes into the sea. Sea in the Bible speaks of unsaved multitudes. That's why the Bible says there'll be no sea in heaven. Doesn't mean there's not gonna be waves and dolphins and Shamu and Flipper. It means there's not gonna be unsaved people in heaven. But the Bible says the river which comes from the throne goes through the church. When it goes out into the sea, the Bible says the waters will be healed. In fact, the King James puts it this way, which doesn't make sense unless you understand spiritual things. It says everything that lives wherever the river comes shall live. So why do I need to live if I'm already alive? A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus one day and said, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can I go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. There's a lot of people in this city that are perfectly alive on the outside. They visited the new Starbucks just this morning. 5.30, there was already a line. Ask me how I know. My excuse is I've got jet lag. I'm not, you know, I'm not that hooked on coffee. It's like Christian crack. No, I'm not that hooked on coffee that I needed to be, except for, so it's the jet lag. But there's a, so they've been to Starbucks, but they're dead on the inside. But the Bible says when the river starts to flow, those people that are walking around alive, but dead on the inside, those that are living will live. What does that? The river does that. It's the river of God that sets our feet to dancing. And the Bible says there'll be healing. I've found time and time again, when that river starts to flow, people start getting healed physically, also emotionally, also relationships, also the mess they've made. God turns it into a masterpiece. That all happens when the river starts to flow. But it's interesting how God taught Ezekiel and through Ezekiel us because an angel came and took Ezekiel and brought him to this river and had him stand in it. And Ezekiel stood in it for a little bit. The Bible says the river was ankle deep. And then the angel took him by the hand and he brought him through the waters and the water was to the knees. 
and then he brought him through a little further. That's not so much how we picture it. Let me, let me tell you what didn't happen. Ezekiel wasn't standing here and the angel said, Ezekiel, what does that feel like? And Ezekiel said, mm, feels good. And the angel says, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait there, Ezekiel, don't move. I'll be right back. And out comes the wings and he flies up to heaven goes to the throne room of God Himself and He turns the big glory wheel whilst watching the river rises to the knees. He quickly turns it off so it doesn't get too high, swoops back down, says, Ezekiel, now what's it like? And Ezekiel says, oh, it was good before, but this river to the knees, it feels wonderful. And the angel kind of smirks and says, well, just, just wait for this. And out come the wings and He goes back up to the, stay there, Ezekiel, I'll be right back. Is that what happened? No. The angel came and took Ezekiel by the hand and the Bible says he brought him through the waters. The water was to the knees and he brought him through the waters. The water was to the waist and he brought him through the waters. We make a mistake that thinking standing exactly where we stood, doing exactly what we've done, for some unexplicable reason, the river will just rise. I'm telling you, your prayer life is, is coming to a different place. Your love life. Not that way. <laughs> your love walk. <laughs> well, maybe that way too. I don't know. We're mostly adults in here and that'd be fine. But you get what I'm saying? <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Can you turn the air up, somebody? <laughs> your love walk. Holy. <laughs> and your love life. But... <laughs> Can you edit that out? At the... <laughs> and you're giving and you're serving and your passion and your worship and your, and your boldness. It, you're not going to stay where you were. There's, there's a deeper river. The river was already deeper, just not where he was standing. Can I be honest with you, my friend? There is a much deeper river than you or I are standing in right now. It, it's going on all over the world. There's a guy in Africa, I was watching him the other day on YouTube. And I mean, he's a good guy. I was watching him, his, his doctrine, and I like him a lot. And I was watching him minister, and I'm thinking to myself, I imagine that that's what, when Jesus started praying for people, that's what the scene would be like. There must have been 30 people in wheelchairs. And he's going down. And when he's praying for them, the power of God is pushing their wheelchairs back. He wasn't pushing them. Just the power of God's hit them and the wheelchairs are rolling back. And then person, after, like all 30 of them, get out of the wheelchair and start running. And I don't mean they could, they could half hobble before and now they're only quarter hobbling. I mean, they were running, leaping and cartwheeling. And blind people were being healed. I mean, the... And I'm watching this guy and I'm thinking, that's what I imagine it was like when Jesus walked in the room. And he began to, it was noised abroad that he came to a particular city, this is called King James, and the multitude came running. They could just touch the hem of his garment. That that I've just described is not happening in my church yet. We're in the river. We are absolutely in the river in our church. There's no doubt, I don't, I don't know whether it's ankles, knees or what, but, but we're in it. God does things, things happen, there's life, there's freedom, there's people being born again. But I am desperate to say, God, here's my hand, take me somewhere deeper. It's the same river, it's the same Holy Spirit. It's not a new thing, it's not a weird thing, it's just so much more. Went to Australia a number of years ago and I'd never been in the Pacific before. My first time to go there. And I remember I stood in there and, and it's cold, surprisingly cold. Like if you've ever been in the Pacific, it's, it's colder than you think, right? These guys are from the Pacific. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the TV shows from California and everyone looks hot. I mean, it is, but the water's cold. Anyways, there I am in Australia and I'm standing in there. I didn't want to go too deep because of all the sharks. Like if you fly out of Adelaide, you will see two things. You will see people sitting on surfboards, no word of a lie. I flew from Adelaide, it's right on the coast. And you go over there and you can see the surfers and you can see the sharks. And I'm thinking, they are crazy. Absolutely, you're seeing the sharks. Anyways, here I am standing in the Pacific. If I was standing in the Pacific and I'm ankle deep and I proclaim with excitement, I'm in the Pacific. Is that true? 
Yes, it's true that I'm in the Pacific, but there's a whole lot more Pacific than I'm in just yet. Are we in the river? Yes. Are we spirit filled? Yes. Do we believe in the things of God? Yes. But I'm telling you, there is a whole lot more Pacific that God wants to bring us into. And I have a feeling He wants to take you and me by the hand and do it today. I mean today. He didn't stand still while the river just miraculously rose. Number one. Number two, the river was already deeper, just not where He was standing. There is a deeper river. It's already going on all over the world. I just want to be standing in that deeper place. But then number three, and I'll close with this. It's interesting to me, you know, that Old Testament description of the river of God that we learn so much of through Ezekiel. There's one difference between the river in the Old Covenant and the river in the New Covenant. It does all the same things. Still brings, still comes from the throne room of God. Still goes through the church. Still goes out into the sea, the unsaved, the multitudes. And as soon as that, as soon as that happens, people start getting saved. Always, every single time. But there's one difference is this. In John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus stood and cried. We read it or quoted it a moment ago. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. This is the biggest difference between the river under the old covenant and the river under the new covenant. And it's this. Under the old covenant, the man got in the river. Under the new covenant, the river gets in the man. We say, man, where do, I, where do I go? Where's the anointing flowing? No, my friend, that river gets in you. That river gets in you. You carry that river. That growth is in you. It deepens in you. It's not event-based. It's not conference-based. It's relationship-based. And that river goes from your ankles to your knees until you're, I mean, you are swimming in that river and that river is swimming in you. Go ahead and close your eyes if you would, please. We're going to pray. I appreciate listening so wonderfully. This isn't like a switch off prayer. This is a just warming up prayer, just to warn you. But stand on your feet, if you would, please. Father, we come before you now. Lord, we are hungry. We're hungry for you. So Lord, I'm asking you in this place, in our lives, Lord, let that river deepen. Let the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of each one of us get deeper. All the things that you'll do through that, all the things that you'll change, Lord, we are welcome. You're welcome to do that. We, we give you permission. Lord, all the consequences, the ramifications of a deeper work of God in my life. What it might do to my reputation, what it might do to my schedule. Lord, I, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Lord, what it will do to these meetings, we're okay with that. Lord, I pray for every single one of us, myself included, that there would be nothing of us that would stand at the edge and watch, but everything of us that would jump in. Lord, forgive me for the times I've been a little too busy. A little too much of John. And I've not noticed what you're doing. I've not noticed that you're leading me somewhere. Lord, my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you now. Our ears are open to hear what you're saying. So Lord, please don't let me miss out. I don't want to miss out. Lord, today I pray, as a thirsty one, I ask you, fill me. Fill me with your spirit that rivers of living water would flow out of me.
You know, I know it's only Sunday morning and we're just starting. But I want to ask this, is there anyone in here beside me who would say, John, what you're talking about today, I am thirsty for that. You know, I want to give the same altar call that Jesus did. He said, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. Is he thirsty for what? He didn't say. He just said, if you're thirsty. So I'm going to actually give the exact same invitation. It, it might get a little squishy up here. It might only be one person. I don't, I don't know that. But could I, in the spirit of Christ, could I give that exact same invitation to you and to me right now? If you are thirsty for what I've been talking about today, would you get out of your seat and come stand up the front here with me? And we're going to ask God, say, Lord, fill us today. Fill us. Fill us. Fill us. If you're up in the balcony, you're welcome to come down as well. In fact, I'd rather you did, because if you get slain in the spirit up there, <laughs> it's a long way down. Is there anybody else you say, John, that's me. That's me. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm going to come. I'm going to lay my hand on you. You have my word. I won't push you. But you will feel the weight of my hand on your head or your shoulders. I might take your hands. The Bible says one of the six basic doctrines of the church is the laying on of hands. I want to lay my hand on you as a point of contact. But I believe that mine will not be the only hand that touches you. So, Father, I'm asking you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, begin something very, very powerful in each one of us today. Something very, very powerful. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name, fill her afresh with your spirit. Fill her in Jesus' name. We might need someone standing behind people as I pray. Is there someone who can do that? A beefy looking guy? Or lady, it's an equal opportunity. You ready? Father, thank you. Fill her with your spirit. Fill her with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you. Guys, come over here. Fill him with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Lord, let a fire burn in him. Let a fire burn in him. In the name of Jesus. Fill him with your spirit. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name, fill her. Let the river of God flow. Let the river of God flow. In the name of Jesus. Lord, fill him with your spirit. God, I'm asking you, take him by the hand. Take him by the hand and lead him deeper. Lead him deeper. That's it. That's it. Lead him deeper. In Jesus' name. Lord, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God. Lord, I'm asking you, take her to that deeper place. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh. Fall afresh. Some of you used to be so familiar with the Holy Spirit, but that river's got a little dry. But I'm telling you, it's coming back. It's coming back. Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Spirit of the living God, fill her, fill her in Jesus' name. Here, step toward me, sir. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, fill him with your spirit. Fill him to overflowing. Lord, I ask you, fill her in the name of Jesus. Fill her. With your spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm asking you right now, fill her with your spirit. Fill her. Fill him in the name of Jesus. Lord, set hearts on fire today. Set hearts on fire today. Let the river of God start to flow in the name of Jesus. Let the river of God start to flow in this place. 
Shemando kosike la babanda kaside mamande. Lord, I'm asking you, fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. Fresh encounter. Let the river flow in her life. In the name of Jesus. Lord, let your river flow. Let your river flow. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, let your river flow. Shemanda kasike la baanda kosida mamande. Let the river flow. Let the river flow in Jesus' name. Lord, we need something to flow through the church in this city, to flow out into the, into the unsaved in this city. So Lord, we come boldly before the throne of grace. We come boldly today. We come to the throne of grace. Shamanda kosike la babanda kasida. Lord, I'm asking you as I lay hands on people, lay your hand on them also in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Shamanda kosike la babanda kashira mamande. In the name of Jesus. Let me come in behind you here. In the name of Jesus. Lord, let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. In the name of Jesus. Shekenda mamato kosira babande. Let the river flow. God, let the river flow. Anoint him. Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you, let the river flow. In Jesus' name. No more dry place. No more dryness. In Jesus' name. No more dryness. In Jesus' name. Lord, let the river flow. Let the river flow. Shamando kosike la mamande. Let the river flow. In Jesus' name. Shamando kosike la mamada kosire baba anda koshonde. Lord, let the river flow. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. In the name of Jesus, God, I'm asking you, let the river flow. Let the river flow in Jesus' name. Let the river flow. Shamando Kosi, let me squeeze in behind you here. I'm coming through. Thank you. Let the river flow in Jesus' name. Let the river flow in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, let the river flow. Shemando kosike la babande, de shika mamande. You ready? I know you've been squashed in there, but in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the river flow. Let the river flow. Shemando kosike la mamande. I remember I was preaching in Longview, Texas once. We, out, we couldn't fit everybody in the altar area to pray, so we went to the aisles. Then we went to the lobby. Then they were out in the car park. It was fantastic. Then car, stars, cars started stopping to see what on earth was going on in the car park. So we prayed for the people in the cars. And I mean, it was just a really tangible example of from the throne because we had worshipped our socks off. And can I warn you, this next few days, we are going to worship our socks off. I will hit as many wrong notes as I get right. I will squeak and crack and croak. But we're going to worship our socks off because there's one thing I know and I love. It's the throne of God. But that river needs a place to go. And it will hit you. It will hit you. And it'll go through you. And how great would it be if we had the same thing? Because you've even got massive great windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That people walking by say, what's going on in it? And then they come and they just get hit by the river. Yeah, yeah. Angela and I were in Mobile, Alabama many years ago. And we were walking out of a Holiday Inn Express. Angela's my wife. And we were getting ready to go to the meetings. And this car screeched to a stop in front of us. He screeched to a stop. He said, where are you going? So we said to church. He said, what church? And I said, it's down the street. I said, you know it? He said, no, I'm not from here. So I don't know why he was asking what church, but anyway. And so he said, can I come? So I said, sure. So he followed us. We drive. He follows us in the car. About 15, 20 minutes. In. I was so excited to get up and share the testimony. I was going to tell him, well, guess what happened? This guy came and he followed us to church and, and he left. I was like, oh, so disappointing. Anyways, so I was up behind the keyboard. He came back with about 20 plus people. And they came in. And I mean, man, God touched them so powerfully in that service. It was incredible. It's the river. He hadn't heard me preach. He didn't know who I was. He said, who are you? Where are you going? It's the river. I'm telling you what God will do when the river starts to flow will blow your socks off. If I haven't prayed for you yet, just raise your hands that, that came up. I'm just going to pray because for the sake of time, this evening we're going to spread out and do lots of things. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this place that is hungry for you, 
God, I'm asking you right now, birth a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. Birth a fresh encounter in the secret place that everyone in this room would know how to access the throne of God and that river would start to flow. Lord, I'm praying for me. I'm praying for Pastor James. I'm asking you, Lord, would you do something in us as well? God, take us deeper. Take us deeper into the throne of God. Lord, that that river can flow. And Lord, we will gladly make all of us, we'll make ourselves a no reputation. Lord, we're not here to do things for us. We're here to lay our lives down and live for an audience of one. So Jesus, be glorified. Be glorified. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. I'm going to put a, 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 a selah, a pause there and hand the service back to Pastor James wherever he wants to do, we're going to take it. But I'm telling you, we're going to pick right back up here when we come tonight. So, so don't, don't wear all your mascara. Don't wear your makeup. Ladies, either don't, don't do that tonight. Just come ready to worship. <laughs> you know, just, just go for it. We're going to jump in the river and worship with everything we've got and release something in this city. We're going to release something. Amen. Amen. So, sir, it is such a joy to be here. I love you. A lot of what we do at Gateway, we pattern after this man and Pastor Mike and Jan over there. And, and, and um, so we're kind of a, a part of an extended agape spirit as well. And our worship, we've always patterned after you. I always say my favorite worship leader and favorite worship is, is when you lead and what you do. So it's a real joy for me to be here. Thank you so much. I love you. And I can't wait for the next few days. So. Bless you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, stay right there, stay right there. Don't move, don't move. You're good, you're good. Stay right there. We're good, we're good. Stay right there. Stay right there, right where you are. Tonight, we'll, when we gathered six, and here's the thing that happens in, uh, in, in our culture. Like, uh, we want it now, right now. Anybody know, ever heard of this word? It's a, it's a form word, it's a Greek word. It's called process. Anybody remember that Greek word? Yeah. And it's when the Lord, like, he, he works. Remember there was, there was a miracle where he laid a hand on, on a man, and, and he said, what do you see? And he said, I see men like trees. And he touched him again. And all I'm telling you is some of you today have just gotten that first touch, and something in you just see, I just see, like, the shadowing of trees. If the man left at that moment before he got another touch, he never gets to see all that God wanted to do in him. In church, I'm encouraging you. It's not about filling this room tonight. It is not, listen, I, I'm not worried about it. One thing, we're gonna take care of, we're gonna bless John, we're grateful for him coming. I'm not trying to get anything from you, but I sure am trying to everything I have to get something to you. I am sure with everything in me, trying to get something to you. So I encourage you. Come on back again. Let the Lord continue to work in you. Come on, let him, let, come on, let him work in you. Show up ready to have him work in you. Show up ready and listen, nothing from you. Haven't asked you for one thing except everything you have, would you just lay it on the altar and let him do that? Okay, here's what I'm encouraging. We got, we got time to work with kids. We're going to take care of the children tonight. Uh, so, so come on, no, no excuses. Go get dinner early or decide to fast the rest of the day, whatever you're going to do. But don't miss. Stay hungry. Here's what's going to happen. When you leave those doors, everything about this world is waiting right outside that door to jump right back on you and to steal from you what God's doing right now and to convince you you're too busy or whatever else to come back. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Father, seal what's in our hearts, what you've done this morning, what you started, seal it in the name of Jesus. That truly we can say no weapon, not even time or commitments, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. We good? We good? Okay, we've done all the announcements. We have no other announcements to give. We have nothing else there. It is right now, 1148. John went 18 minutes over. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna, I'm going to dismiss you right now. 
I'm encouraging you. We're going to start at 6. Come early if you want to come at 5.30. I would love, 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 love if there are people that want to come at 5.30. And would you just come on in and just begin to pray for the service? Uh, there's not going to be an organized person from the front. You can come in and pray right here. Would you just come in and begin to pray? And begin not just to ask the Lord for what he's doing in your life, but would you ask God to do things in the lives of people in our city? We are at a pivotal point in our history of who we are as a city and as a community. And we don't need God to make agape famous. We need Jesus to be famous. We need people to know that when you come to Jones County, Mississippi, what you feel, that, that hometown feel, is the presence of God. Okay? Y'all with me? I will see you tonight at 6. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.